Hi guys, in this video we will be learning about where water is stored on Earth, understanding the factors which drive the change in magnitude of water stores, as well as understanding the role of drainage basin systems. First of all, we're going to understand where water is stored on planet Earth. All water on planet Earth is described as being part of the hydrosphere, and the hydrosphere is 97% in the ocean, and 3% of it is locked up in fresh water. So, as you can see, the oceans account for the largest part of the Earth's water. And the hydrosphere can be divided up into four different groups, which we're going to look at all in more detail. The first being oceanic water, then cryospheric, terrestrial and atmospheric water. And as I said, we're going to go into detail on each of these different stores of water on Earth. And these all make up the hydrosphere. So the first store we're going to look at is oceanic water. And as we just learnt, the oceanic store is the largest store of water on Earth and accounts for 97% of the Earth's water in total. Now, oceans cover 72% of the Earth's surface and we can see that in this map of the world here. The blue represents all the oceans and seas and as you can see, it constitutes a very large proportion of the Earth's total surface. And oceanic water is broken up into oceans and seas. For example, an example of an ocean would be the Pacific, whilst seas are smaller versions of oceans, such as the North Sea. And as you might know, the oceanic water is typically very salty, and it also has a falling pH, which means it is becoming more acidic over time. And we'll look at this later on in a different video. The next store of water we have is cryospheric water. And cryospheric water is water that is stored on Earth in solid form. So you most likely know the solid version of water is ice. So the stores of cryospheric water we have on Earth include things like sea ice, permafrost, which is an area of land where water is frozen into the soil. We don't need to know much about this. Also stored in the ice caps, um, ice sheets and glaciers. And this is just a photograph to show you how large ice sheets and ice caps can be. And all of this is a store of water. The next store we have is terrestrial water. And terrestrial water is the water that is fresh water, but on the earth. So this includes surface water, such as rivers and lakes. We have groundwater, and this is simply the water that's held within the ground. Soil water, water that's held within the soil, and also biological water. And this is water that is stored within biomass, so this means within plants and animals. Because as you may know, animals, well humans, are made up of 70% water. So a lot of water is locked up within biomass. And our last store of water is the atmosphere, and it's an atmospheric water. And atmospheric water can be held in all three states, so it can be held as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. The gas version of water is water vapour. Um, and as we know, we get things like snow and ice that can be held within clouds in the sky. So a lot of water is actually held in the atmosphere, obviously not as much as held in the oceans, but as you can see from this satellite photo here, this is the extent of clouds over Earth. So a lot of water is locked up within clouds and within the atmosphere. And just to point out, water vapour is actually clear and you can't see it. So any clouds are actually made up of solid and liquid water, not water vapour. Water vapour you cannot see. And this is really important for global warming. Water held in the atmosphere actually acts as a greenhouse gas and is used to control the Earth's temperature. So this makes the amount of water held within our atmosphere really, really important and is something we'll look at later on. Now we're going to look at the factors driving the change in magnitude of water stores. So this is the transfer of water between its different stores. And this diagram here shows us how water can move between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. 
and we're going to focus on these two here so obviously solid to liquid is going to be melting and freezing and when liquid water turns into a gas this is called evaporation and gas turning into a liquid is called condensation and the process of water turning into a solid we're not really going to look at but this is called sublimation that's ice turning into a gas straight away skipping out the liquid state for now we're going to focus on condensation and evaporation and then learn a bit more about these so as i mentioned just now evaporation is water turning from its liquid state to its gaseous state and this is controlled by a variety of factors firstly for liquid water to become a gas this requires energy and this is usually in the form of solar radiation. So the solar radiation is going to heat up the water and this is what allows it to become a gas. Another factor is the availability of water. If there's no water available, there's not going to be any gas formed. Also, the humidity is really important. If the air is already really saturated, which means really concentrated with water vapor as a gas, this is going to make it harder for liquid to turn into a gas, whereas if there's very little water vapour in the air, it will very readily turn into a gas. And also temperature is really important as well. If it's too cold, this process of evaporation won't take place, um, but if it's really hot, this increases the rate of evaporation. So evaporation favours hotter temperatures. And this you'll know from when you boil a kettle, you're going to get steam when the liquid is turning into a gas. That's because the water is heating up. And then condensation. And condensation is the reverse process of this with the gas turning into a liquid. And this is the main form of precipitation, otherwise known as rain. So when it's raining, this is condensation happening. So any water vapour in the air is turning into liquid water. And this can happen when air temperature is reduced. Hot air can hold more water vapour. So when it cools, it can no longer hold this water vapour and this water vapour turns back into water. And also condensation can form if the volume of air increases without a temperature rise. And this will also cause the water vapour to turn back into a liquid. So the two factors for condensation here are temperatures reducing and volume increasing. So now that we've learned how water is transferred between its different stores, we're going to look at an example, which is the drainage basin system. And a drainage basin is an area of land drained by a river and its tributaries. And the border around a drainage basin is called a watershed. And this essentially just marks the boundary of the drainage basin. And drainage basins are open systems. We learned about these in our last video. And this means that energy and matter can transfer in and out of the system. So water can come from outside the drainage basin and end up within it through the movement of clouds and so on. And it's also a cascading system. We're going to look about this in more detail. And this is where the inputs and outputs of one open system within the drainage basin system flow into the inputs of another system. So I'll show you more about this just in a minute. So this is a diagram of a drainage basin system and in the system we have our inputs, our stores and our processes. So I'm going to go through this in more detail starting with the inputs into our drainage basin system. So inputs in a drainage basin system are going to be things like precipitation, which is rain, or snow. So as you can see in this diagram here, we have precipitation coming from our clouds when they're condensing and it's falling onto the land. So that's the input into our drainage basin system. Now we're going to look at some of the stores in our drainage basin system, which is storing the rainwater that is our input. So the stores in our drainage basin system are going to include interception. 
An interception is shown here on this diagram, and this is when trees and plants are going to collect water, for example, like on their leaves, and this water is going to get trapped in the vegetation. So that is what interception means. This is stopping the water from hitting the ground directly, and the water is being temporarily stored in plants. Another store of water in the drainage basin system is going to be in the soil, and water is going to be stored here. The soil is going to soak up water. Water can also be stored in rivers, so river discharge is one of our other stores. And another store, for example, is a lake. There's no lake on this diagram, but just to label it in, lakes are a store of water. So now the other characteristic in our drainage basin systems, or any other system, is going to be processes. So processes are the ways that water is moving within the drainage basin system. So we're going to look at these in more detail now. So as remembered for some of the water when it rains is going to be intercepted in plants or trees and the way that this water then reaches the ground is via stem flow and we can imagine stem flow as just being water trickling down the stems of plants and animals until it reaches the ground and that is stem flow. Then we also have another flow which is surface runoff and surface runoff is simply water flowing across the surface of the ground. We also have a process called infiltration and this is when the water is moving downwards through the soil, it's infiltrating the soil. So that is what infiltration is, it's another one of our processes. And we also have a very similar type of flow called through flow. And through flow is very similar to infiltration, but it's just a faster movement of water through the soil. And then when the water has moved through the soil, it may reach the water table or where the rock is. And where water is moving down through the rock, this is the process called percolation. And then once the water has percolated into the rock, it moves as groundwater flow or base flow. So these are our flows. And then these are our underground flows, but we also have channel flow, which is above ground, and this is the water that's flowing within rivers. So the flows that we need to know and understand in the drainage basin system are stem flow, surface runoff, infiltration, through flow, percolation, groundwater flow, and base flow. And these are the ways that our water is moving between the stores in the drainage basin system. And then finally, we have our outputs of our drainage basin system. And this is when the water has finally reached the sea or a lake. And the output of the drainage basin system is going to be evaporation shown here or another output is transpiration and transpiration is when water is transpiring or evaporating straight from plants back into the atmosphere so our outputs are evaporation and transpiration as we learned that is when the water is turning from a liquid back into a gas and going back into the atmosphere so our outputs are evaporation and transpiration and that is the end of our drainage basin system. As we just saw, we have a water cycle within local drainage basin systems, but water is also cycled on a global scale. And we have circulations of water between the ocean and then the land and the ocean. So that's one cycle. We also have circulations of water which remain just over land, such as we saw in the previous bit on the drainage basin system. And an example of land circulation would be when it's raining onto the land and then the water is being transpired straight back from the plants into the atmosphere. So that would be an example of land to land circulation. And we also get circulations which are just from ocean to ocean without any on the land. So for example, as we can see on this map here, the Pacific Ocean actually only really transfers water around the Pacific and doesn't really affect the land or the water doesn't really move onto the land. However, the water that's in the Atlantic Ocean, which lies 
between the continents of Europe and Africa and North and South America. A lot of the water in the Atlantic Ocean is going to be transferred into the land of North America and South America and then be transferred back into the Atlantic. So that's ocean to land circulation. And then where we have the equator, which runs across the Earth, as shown by this line here, these areas are very tropical areas, and here we get a lot of land to land circulation. So across this middle belt of Africa, across the equator, we have a lot of waters just circulating here and not being affected by the oceans or being transferred back into the oceans. Water is simply evaporated from the land, from plants and so on, and then it rains again, replacing the water back into the plants. So that is how water is recirculated on a global scale. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.